Generational wealth, basically wealth that is passed down from one generation to the next. There are several items that you may not have thought of that fits the category of wealth, investing in stocks and bonds and real estate, even a family business to pass down or managing what has been passed down so you can keep it, grow it and not lose it. The good news is it's not too late to plan and to start your own wealth to pass on to your children and their children. In less than a minute, you'll meet my guests who will share information with you that you'll find very useful to get your wealth plan started and or cultivated. Later in this program, Alanta Wright Horn will be chatting with the principal of a Brooklyn school about college admission the essential process for a high school students to be competitive candidates among thousands of other students across the United States and abroad. But let's begin with generational wealth. And let me welcome my guest, Kiara Gray. Kiara, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. Thank you. Well, let's begin with the question that thousands of people may be asking, what is generational wealth? So generational wealth is something that we've seen so many other people be able to, to accomplish, and that is passing down assets, whether that be real estate, stocks, cash, family businesses from one generation to the other. So really being able to have and create that legacy for not only yourself, but thinking about your children and your children's children into the future. A question that some people may be asking is, why is that important for people of color? Yes, it's critically, generational wealth is critically important for people of color. And the reason for that is the fact that historically we have had so many challenges and roadblocks with holding on to our assets and being able to um, give a leg up and a, a fresh start for um, our kids and our, and our children's children. And so um, right now becomes a really, really critical point in time where we have so much access to information. We have the internet. We have so many resources to learn and be able to um, really close that gap to the access to information so that we can not only strive to create wealth for ourselves, but really have the opportunity to create generational wealth and be able to change that entire narrative on what it looks like for Black and Brown people to be able to, um, you know, make money, build businesses, and more importantly, have those things live well beyond ourselves. We talk about building wealth. Uh, let's talk about attitudes towards building wealth. So many people take money that they have, they don't think it's important, and they're buying clothes, they're buying, especially ladies, uh, they're <laughs> spending lots of money on their on dulling their hair, and, and men are you know, buying things that perhaps they don't need. So talk about the importance of what do you do with your money? Absolutely. So I'm not going to knock anyone who spends a little bit on their hair. But what I will say is that we have to be very intentional about the decisions that we're making today and the impacts that it's going to make on years and years to come. You know, my husband and I investing in real estate in Baltimore, you know, fresh out of college, we started to think about how do we take the money and things that we're earning today and make sure that it's paying us dividends over years to come. And what's really, really exciting to me right now is that we seem to be in what we've called kind of this black wealth renaissance, where there's so many people really thinking about how do I, you know, get beyond just thinking about making sure I have the newest Jordans to what am I, you know, where am I living, right? Is my, are the, the funds that I'm spending on my highest expense each month, which for most people across this country is their housing expense, how do I make sure that that is not only serving me today, but really serving me in long long term, right? And so I think right now it becomes a matter of people balancing, you know, really being comfortable in, in their life today, but also 
thinking about what decisions am I making today, right? How can I learn more about stocks or real estate or make sure even the smallest decisions really can have the largest impact. And so, you know, historically, we've thought about young people about being a little bit more um, frivolous with their spending. But what we're seeing is more people learning about real estate, learning about stocks and figuring out how to make sure that um, they're making, you know, really intentional and smart decisions and creating wealth for themselves, you know, for, for years to come. Who did you have as an example in your life or who encouraged you? Did your parents encourage you? Are there people from the outside who did that? And uh, how do you relate this to what you would give your listeners as advice? Yeah, absolutely. I was a, uh, I was a beneficiary of a very strong family with a very deep history. And so I learned a lot about my ancestors who actually owned the land that Lincoln University, one of the first HBCUs, uh, sits on. And so having a history of a family that created its own town and community in the early 1800s called Hinsonville in Pennsylvania planted seeds in me as a child that I really didn't realize or understand until I became an adult and started to connect some of the, the dots around decisions that we were making. And so that really led me to think about community building, ownership, being able to own and have land and businesses. And so as I became an adult, really being thoughtful about the time that I was spending, um, how am I, if I'm willing to work very, very hard for someone else as an employee, imagine how hard I can work for myself and my community. And that's what has really um, lit a fire under myself and my husband as we run our, our business, uh, Charm City Buyers out of Baltimore, to be able to um, not only create that community, that opportunity for generational wealth for ourselves, but really empower and provide the resources for other people to do the same for themselves and their families as well. Talk to those young people, even, even adults, who are yeah. not as fortunate as you have been to have wealth passed on to you. Yes, what advice absolutely. do you give them? Absolutely. So I, I'm the first to say we are not a product of having a trust fund. We are a product, actually, that that family history, a product of having a family that had a lot of assets and lost them for one reason or the other. And so I am very big on really charging folks to um, take advantage of the fact that hindsight is 2020. Right. And so if we knew then what we know now, we would have done so many things so differently. And so I really am big on whether young, older or anywhere in between being able to take the opportunity to say you may have or could have done something differently in the past. But now there's so many opportunities to open doors uh, for yourself and to learn and to use YouTube University if that's what you have access to to empower yourself to get the information that you need and take action. I think a lot of times we think about wealth and um, you know making all this money or whatever it is, these huge goals that so many people have, and that becomes overwhelming. And I'm very big on reminding folks that every single day, even the smallest actions, continue to push forward towards your goals. So always focus on that next step forward as you keep your eye on the prize on the bigger, higher goals that we're all looking to reach and accomplish. That next step forward that you talk about. So many people are tied to their past. They're tied to the efforts in the past that didn't work out for them. Um, so encourage people who are listening to you uh, to put the past behind them, unless it's a good past that can drive them forward. Absolutely. So every loss or hard lesson learned is a, a lesson to equip you with the tools you need for the next step, that next step in, in action. And so one thing that's been really, really helpful for me in my journey is to have that, that clarity of thought, whether it's writing down my goals or my dreams, being able to vision board, being able to really put on paper um, what I wanted to do and accomplish, 
And then it's a matter of really trying to, to work your way backwards and figure out what is that next best step, right? If I want to, you know, uh, buy this building down the street, my next best step is to do some research on that property or my next best step maybe getting on YouTube and learning more about buying property, right? And so it's really about constantly making those small steps forward to be able to, to reach those big goals. But writing them down is huge. And also identifying your fears, right? Identifying what are those roadblocks that you come across, whether it's financial, whether it's your, your relationship with money, whether it's your relationship with um, you know, your, your family or what have you identify what those roadblocks are and start to figure out how you can navigate those to keep you on that path to the next best action step. Our program, of course, is about generational wealth. And you talked just now about writing things down. Uh, so let's talk about how do you create a plan to build wealth and then to pass on that wealth to your children and to your generations to come. Absolutely. So planning is very, very important. Um, really thinking about what it is that, what your vision is for that next generation as you're thinking about generational wealth. And so when we were creating our plan, um, knowing that we have an eight-year-old daughter, what is it that we want her to experience or have for herself? And so that's those steps for us and our plan started with life insurance. It started with things like creating our will. It started with things like thinking about um, you know, what her you know, schooling education would be and what we would need to do to be able to fully fund those types of opportunities. Um, and so again, it's one of those things where your goals may be very big, but you can chunk them down into smaller pieces to be able to accomplish. Um, and writing all, down all those plans is, is critically important. So visualize and then start to break those things into smaller pieces so that you can create those action steps to make it happen. You talked about creating wills. Weren't you a little young to be <laughs> writing a will? Well, I think a lot of times, you know, I think we underestimate how important those types of things are. And so the, as, once we became parents, um, we also had some assets. So we had some real estate. Um, but as a parent, really thinking about what you want to happen and accomplish, I think wills, sometimes we misconceive them as only for people who have a whole lot of things, but really it was what is our plan or our vision for the experience of our daughter if something was to happen? Um, and so all of that becomes really critically important. And I think when we think about generational wealth and Black wealth in particular, um, the opportunity to have effective life insurance, the opportunity to have really effective wills and estate plans is critical to making sure that that's happening into the future. So you can't be too young. You can't have not enough. It's really about just putting those things into paper. Doesn't matter if it's on the back of a napkin at some point, as long as you are taking those steps to, to put things forth. You talked about preparing your daughter and yes. preparing for your daughter. But in our Black community, uh, there are so many people who don't prepare a future for their kids. I want to hear your views about the importance of that. In fact, challenge uh, our young people and uh, our adults to see the importance of preparing for their kids and preparing for a future. Absolutely. I, I think that there's nowadays there's so few people who don't have a story about someone who has passed away and there was an estate issue or those properties are a pass from one generation to another and things didn't happen the way they would have wanted, right? You had to sell the property because no one had access to the capital to do the renovation or what have you. And so um, it's really another example of hindsight being 2020 and taking better, more informed action now than we have in the past. And so, you know, if, if we've all had experiences like that, how, how critical 
um, and important and powerful is it for us to have the opportunity to change that narrative for that next generation? And that's really what it's all about, right? We could talk all day long about the things that we wish could have or should have been different in the past, but now the power is in our hands to do something different, to make new things happen and to transform what it looks like for our kids and our kids' kids to, to grow up in this world. Something different could be education. There are people who own property. Yeah. There are people who own businesses, but they don't provide the kind of information that will help their kids take over from them after they have passed on. Absolutely, yes. For us, our daughter, our eight-year-old daughter, Michaela, she can probably manage the construction projects better than we can at this point. So it's it's a, that exposure is the opportunity to not only um, show them what show her what our business is like, but really empower her to understand the opportunities of making her own decisions and being able to create her own you know empire at some point if that's what she decides to do. And so for us, it was very important as we created our plan and part of our vision was to make sure that she had the privilege and the opportunity to have options, right? That for us became a very big focal point for, uh, for the future of, of our daughter. Um, and so for other folks who are thinking about their children, what is it that you wish you could have or you know, should have had growing up and how today can you create that opportunity for them, whether it's through your own resources or through exposure to more people, to more opportunities, to more places, so that we know that our world is so much bigger than our block and our neighborhood and our community. And there's so much more out there when we know that we have the power uh, to be able to go out, reach out and, and make it happen. Kyra Gray, I want to thank you for the wealth of information that you have shared. And uh, I'm sure that our viewers are probably gonna to want to know how to reach you. How do we reach you? Yes, thank you so much again for having us. So again, I am Kiara Gray from Charm City Buyers. You can learn more about us on social media at Charm City Buyers uh, everywhere and at charmcitybuyers.com. Um, we're also on YouTube and have a ton of information there as well to learn not only about building wealth, generational wealth and investing in real estate, but also how do we make sure that a city like Baltimore continues to grow and develop over time and we have a say on what that looks like. Thank you. And thank you for being on Brooklyn 45 and I wish you success. Thank you so much, thank you. And now over to Alanta Wrighton. Thanks, Sam. Getting ready for the college application process can feel overwhelming, intimidating, confusing, and at the same time exciting for high school students and their families. Many times the right information never gets into the hands of high schoolers, resulting in far too many students in high school missing the opportunity to attend college, what I call the information gap. Approaching the college application timeline strategically helps students and families maximize the odds of getting into their college of choice. Joining us to share that timeline, what our guest today calls the Scholastic Roadmap, is Principal George Leonard, an educator with over 40 years experience, the former and founding principal of Bedford Academy High School in Brooklyn, the current principal of Campus Charter, and biology professor at Mega Everest College. Welcome to Brooklyn 45, Principal Leonard. It is my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities. Yes. So before we get into the roadmap of what all high school students and parents should know, let's start with the end in mind. What is the college admissions end goal and how should high school students and parents strategize? You know, it's, it's the type of strategy that needs to start very early. Um, the, the, the outcome, the desired outcome is for students to be accepted to colleges that they have desired to attend for so long with um, a tuition free um, road for their parents. But a lot of times parents struggle to pay the, the tuition fees, and that sometimes can determine which school the child attends. But 
if the child is able to be academically prepared to apply to college, the things that they need to know are the following. Um, they need to know the course of study that these admissions boards are looking for. And what they're looking for, they're looking for the SAT score, the AP scores, and their GPA. Now, this is the problem. New York is the only state in this country that gives regents. It used to be New York and California. Now it's just New York. So when New York candidates are applying to college, they're applying with competition from students from these other states where there's no regents. So these students have kind of a leg up on the students from New York because we're being judged by regents, AP, and SAT, whereas they're judged by AP and just SAT. And when it comes to course of study, I think we wait too long to get students ready, regents ready, so that when they enter high school, they can focus on advanced placement curriculum, SAT prep, um, knowing how to fill out the FAFSA application and knowing how to fill out a college admissions application. This is where they fall short because they have to write an essay. So they have to be able to um, have these skills really fine tuned way before ninth grade. So Principal Leonard, what would the coursework look like for a ninth and 10th grader? Ideally, to get a Regis diploma, and not advanced regents diploma, because there's so many. There's a local regents, um, advanced regents diploma, um, advanced regents diploma with honors. So for just the basic requirements, a student needs to take living environment, algebra one, US history. Those are some of the basic um, requirements that you need just to get the ball rolling. So in the ninth grade, you would you know, speak with the guidance counselor and make sure that your, um, your transcript is reflecting a science. So it's either gonna be living environment or science. It's gonna be um, algebra one, common core. It's gonna be um, US government and it's gonna be a foreign language and, and then the ELA series. Cause you gotta take at least um, ELA twice um, each semester in high school. But the regents, would be the living environment regions, the algebra regions, and the US history regions. Now this, is, now, this is the problem. The problem is that if a student is taking regents exams as a ninth grader, a lot of times they're trying to make the adjustment from K to eight, because K to eight needs to adequately prepare students for nine through 12. It doesn't bridge it well enough so that when students are taking regions for the first time, Sometimes it's uncharted ground and they don't prepare properly. And a lot of these um, regents courses comes with a, um, a laboratory requirement, like in living environment and earth science, um, it comes with a lab. And so again, it comes with maturity and it comes with a student being really focused on um, course completion. So my recommendation is that when students are in middle school, Middle school can adequately prepare students for um, living environment algebra in seventh grade, um, chemistry and geometry in eighth grade. Because the youngest child that, that I was able to prepare for the living environment regions was in third grade. Um, I had eight year olds taking living environment regions when it was called biology regions. And then we went on to prepare them for the chemistry, algebra, and geometry regions while they were still in elementary school. Um, and you know, my claim to fame is being able to take a child, no matter what grade they're in, prepare them for the regions so that by the time they get to high school, they can focus on the AP curriculum. So I would say that for ninth grade, for the minimum, it would be um, algebra, living environment, U.S. history, they got to get through those. They got to score at least 80 or better for these admissions boards to take them seriously. Um, a lot of these admissions boards in these, um, you know, HBCUs and, and these Ivy League schools, this is what they do. They look for the SAT first. So if the child is not scoring at least 1,000 to 1,200 on the SAT, 
because now they kind of phased out the written portion. So now it's not, you know, 2,400, it's back to 1,600. They're looking for at least them breaking 1,000. Um, so they get like 500 on the, um, on the quantitative and another 500 on the, um, on the verbal. And students need to prepare for the SAT as soon as they get into high school. They can't wait for the 11th grade to start preparing for SAT. It's too late because um, they actually need to prepare for the SAT when they're in middle school. So um, again, the thing that's important is that in ninth and 10th grade, the students should have completed living environment, algebra one, US government, chemistry, geometry, and then start taking global one and two, because global is two is a two year course. So they got to take global one and two, three and four. So they would take the regions, um, completing at least two sciences, two math sections, foreign language, um, and US history while they're taking global in the 10th grade. Well, that's a lot, Mr. Leonard. A lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on. And, um, and let me just say this before you, um, you know, go on. SAT prep has to happen in middle school. Students are so caught up with the SSAT, the, um, the, uh, the specialized high school um, achievement test, the co-op exam, um, and they, they, they lose sight of what really needs to be really honed in on, which is the SAT, because you have the SAT, the SAT2, which is subject related. You have the ACT, the achievement test. Um, this is what the colleges are looking for. They're looking for a student that is well-rounded, but they're also looking for a student that can show um, some kind of competency with written expression. Um, and they're looking at these ELA scores. They're looking at these math scores and they're looking at the region scores. So understand that if you have a low region score, then that SAT has to be so high that it takes their focus off how you did poorly on the regions, but did well on the SAT and did well on the advanced placement curriculum. Because without that curriculum, you're not gonna be adequately prepared for your first year of college. Well, Principal Leonard, you've dropped some gems. And um, I look forward to continuing the conversation for what this looks like for 11th and 12th graders. So thank you for your expertise and the support that you've given the students tonight and families on high school, college acceptance. Yes, I, you know, I, I've been dealing with this since 1981. Um, I think I've kind of perfected the, uh, the roadmap to a, a successful acceptance into um, a college with a four year of scholarship. Thank you for your expertise and the support you have given to students and families today in part one of this topic, Scholastic Roadmap Preparation for College Admission. Stay tuned for part two, where we talk about what this roadmap looks like for 11th and 12th graders. I am Alanta Rydon, back to you, Sam. Thank you, Alanta Right On. And to our viewers, we thank you for watching this program. And we invite you to partner with Brooklyn 45. We are a 501c3 not for profit community TV program. And when you support us, our communities benefit as well. So do you. So please tell everyone you know on social media. And on behalf of our Brooklyn 45 team, I'm Sam Tate. <music>